Hello everyone and welcome back to our second lecture in the series Aerodynamics for Pilots. This lecture is on aircraft drag. There are three basic types of drag that affect aircraft performance. The first is lift-dependent drag, also known as induced drag. We discussed this a bit in our lecture on lift. Lift-dependent drag represents the energy lost in the downwash that, that is created in order to generate the lift that holds the aircraft up. Profile or form drag, also called parasitic drag, is the familiar drag that is always there on any object moving through a fluid. It also represents energy lost, in this case to skin friction and in the vortices left behind bluff bodies. Compressibility drag is the energy lost in shockwave systems that start to become important close to the speed of sound. We will be ignoring compressibility drag as the kind of aircraft we generally fly operate at low Mach numbers. The only part of the aircraft that gets close to sonic speeds are the propeller tips. <coughs> Just to remind you again what lift and drag are. Lift is a force at right angles to the airflow, and drag is parallel to the airflow. Note that the lift is not always vertical, nor is the drag always horizontal. So let's start with lift-dependent drag on an aircraft in steady flight. If you remember from our previous lecture, the aircraft keeps up by grabbing a certain amount of air and pushing it down. The lift is given by Newton's second law which is that the mass of air pushed down times the downdraft velocity equals the lift. And of course, in steady flight, the lift equals the weight of the aircraft. It turns out that the volume of air per second that the aircraft works on is about equal to the volume of the cylinder shown, which is a circle drawn round the wingtips as the swept area times the forward velocity. For a given aircraft at a given altitude, the only way to change the volume of air thrown down is to change the forward speed, which, which uh, changes the length of that cylinder. For a constant weight, as the speed goes up, the length of the cylinder shown increases, and therefore the downdraft velocity can be reduced. Induced drag represents the energy left behind the, in the sinking air behind the aircraft. Now you might ask the question, isn't this a little artificial? Is it really true that the air entrained in the downdraft is des described by that very simple cylinder drawn round the wingtips? The answer is that it really is true to a close approximation. For those of you mathematically inclined, try doing an energy balance for the aircraft based on the cylinder of air model, and you'll end up with a classic formula for induced drag, that is, the induced drag coefficient is given by the lift coefficient squared divided by pi times the wing aspect ratio. So yes, the model does indeed give remarkably good answers. As I mentioned, you can increase the amount of air being worked on and decrease the downdraft by increasing speed. But one of the nice things is that a speed increase has a double whammy effect. Let's take, for example, an aircraft in level flight, flying very slowly at a high angle of attack. As we discussed in the previous lecture, the effect of airflow is coming in at a downward angle because of the effect of the high downdraft. The lift being perpendicular to the effect of airflow is rotated backwards, introducing that turquoise induced drag force vector you see at the top. Now let's double the airspeed. Even if the downdraft remains the same, which it doesn't of course, we will come back to that, the effect of the increase of the, in airspeed is to rotate the effect of airflow down towards the horizontal. That rotates the lift vector forward, reducing the size of the induced drag force. So that is whammy number one. S have a look again how increasing that airflow vector just rotates everything to a more horizontal uh, airflow and the induced drag drops. So that was whammy number one. Whammy number two 
is that when you increase the airspeed, the length of that cylinder increases, which means that for a given lift, you can use less downdraft, as Newton tells us. So that gives us our second whammy. Starting with an airplane at double the original speed, we reduce the downdraft velocity. The reduction in downdraft again rotates the effective airflow round towards the horizontal, rotating the lift ve vector forward again and cutting the induced drag to that very small arrow that we have at the top of the diagram. See that? And so the and so what happens is that the induced drag goes down with the square of the speed and it reduces very rapidly as airspeed increases. The wing shape also affects the downdraft and hence the induced drag. Now as you can imagine, ideally you want a perfectly uniform downwash behind the aircraft. It makes sense that if the downwash varies all over the place, the wing will be less efficient than if the downdraft is uniform. And that is a function of the wing shape, mostly the plan. First, let's take a square wing plan, like the Hershey bar wing on the early Piper Cherokee range of aircraft. For a square wing, the downdraft is relatively low in the center and increases towards the wingtips. This is not ideal from an induced drag point of view, but it does give a really good handy characteristics. As you know, downdraft reduces the effective angle of attack, so on a square wing, the wingtips are just naturally at a lower angle of attack than the center, leading to very mild stall characteristics. The wingtips are still flying when the root is stalled, and there's little tendency to drop a wing. There's even some aileron control, and as everyone who's ever trained on one knows, the Cherokees behave very, very well in the stall. The opposite extreme is the very tapered wing. This has a high downdraft at the root and less downdraft at the tips. In fact, for an extreme wing like I have shown, there's actually an updraft at the tips. Such an aircraft would normally have vicious stall characteristics. The tips stall first, while the route is still flying. For a plain, untwisted flat wing, that would give you an immediately unstable wing drop in the stall and rapid spin development. Now, tapered wings are structurally efficient, so they're very popular. The nasty stall characteristics are tamed by means of twisting the wing to reduce the incidence at the tips, or by installing stall strips at the root that ensure an early root stall, and other techniques. Next time you are standing next to a, an aircraft with a tapered wing, take a look and you'll see some of these techniques which are used to improve the stall characteristics and improve the, the tendency to stall first at the tips. You won't see them on the Cherokee. So what is the wing shape that gives the perfect constant downdraft? It turns out that an elliptical wing shape does the trick. Does that wing pl um, plan look familiar? It should if you're an aviation buff. The so-called lifting line theory that explained the physics of downwash was developed in the late 1920s and was enthusiastic enthusiastically used in the design of several aircraft in the built in the 1930s. Many aircraft at that time had roughly elliptical wing plans, notably the Supermarine Spitfire. The Spitfire wing was elliptical for several reasons, including the minimum induced drag criterion. It has a completely untwisted wing, and the whole wing stalls at the same time. Another famous elliptically winged aircraft was the Republic Thunderbolt. So that's all we're going to talk about for induced drag. Now let's take a look at uh, parasitic or profile drag, uh, which is the kind that affects your car, your boat, your bicycle, everything. Here are a few representative shapes in their drag coefficients. Now when we're talking about airplanes, we always use the wing area in the denominator of the drag coefficient formula. But here there is no wing, so instead we base the drag coefficients on the cross-sectional area of the body. 
as all of these have the same cross-sectional area. The drags are directly comparable. The flat disk facing the airflow has a drag coefficient of about 1.28. Uh, and we arbitrarily are assigning that the 100% the um, number. The, uh, the highest drag you can normally get is from a parachute shape. It has a CD of about 1.7, which is about 30% higher than a flat plate. If you streamline a shape, you can reduce drag quite dramatically. The CD of the streamlined body shown is 0 0.045, which is only 3.5% of the flat plate drag of the of a body of the same cross-sectional area. So streamlining is very effective, reducing drag by 97%, sometimes more. The converse, of course, is that if you have a very well streamlined aircraft, quite a small bluff space, space <coughs> shape shoved into the airstream can really reduce the overall slipperiness of the aircraft. Because the formula for CD has a V-squared term in it, parasitic drag goes up with the square of the speed, which is to say it goes up with the dynamic pressure. Do you remember Q from the previous lecture? just want to give you an example of the effectiveness of streamlining. Here we have a low drag laminar aerof aerofoil. If we were to draw a cylinder which had the same drag as that wing, how big would it be? As big as a dime? As big as the cross-section of a pencil? This is the size of the equivalent cylinder. In fact, in the interest of clarity, I've actually exaggerated the size of the dot in this diagram. So that gives you an idea why wire-braced structures are so expensive aerodynamically. One wire can be as drag as the whole wing. So now we put our lift-dependent drag, which drops with airspeed squared, together with our parasitic or profile drag, which goes up with airspeed squared, to give us the total drag for the aircraft. Unlike a car, or a bicycle, or other vehicle, an aircraft has a definite minimum drag speed, and that is always where the induced drag and the profile drag lines cross. A car or bike has a minimum drag speed of zero, but for an aircraft, flying very slowly can be just as draggy or even draggier than flying very fast. Note that higher speeds, the induced drag drops so low to be, as to be unimportant. There is a well-known rule of thumb that for a 5% increase in top speed, you need a 15% increase in power. That rule of thumb is based on totally neglecting the effect of induced drag, and it works pretty well because induced drag is fairly unimportant at top speed. We will be addressing this curve and the associated power curve in detail in the next lecture dedicated to performance. Streamlining is all about smoothness and smooth transitions. On the left we have a Mustang fighter of the Second World War. Parasitic drag was of crucial importance as it affected the top speed, which was a huge factor in effectiveness and survivability. For example, look at that beautiful wing fillet that smooths the transition between the fuselage and the wing. By contrast, on the right, we have the same transition on a Piper Warrior. This aircraft was built for a price, and it was simply not cost-effective to improve that wing-body junction. One of the nice things about the new composite aircraft is that you can cost-effectively introduce compound curves in production that provide built-in filleting and streamlining. Uh, remember that I talked about how a little flat plate area can have a big effect on drag? Well, does anybody see a flat plate here? The rear view mirror. That rear view mirror is responsible for over 5% of the total drag of this aircraft at top speed. Later in the war, the Spitfire was fitted with a teardrop canopy for several reasons, one of which was to get the mirror in and out of the airstream.
here's another example. The Cirrus range of aircraft are composite with very smooth skins and very good streamlining. So they are efficient aerodynamic, aerodynamically. But if you take off those wheel spats, the parasitic drag of the whole aircraft goes up by about 45%. So a small change to well streamlined aircraft can have a really quite enormous effects. Finally, let's look at how the drag char characteristics affect an aircraft in slow flight. Slow flight is basically when you're operating in the blue region, lower than minimum drag speed, what we talk about as operating behind the curve. The first thing, note how steeply the drag goes up in the blue part as compared to the normal flight realm. And it's an unstable region. The more drag you have, the slower you go. The slower you go, the more drag you have. For an aircraft like Concorde, which had to operate well into this regime to land, the instability was too much for a human to handle. They had to install an auto throttle system to manage the thrust. For light aircraft though, slow flight is fairly easy to manage if you keep the speed constant and adjust the altitude by throttle setting. This regime is experienced mostly in takeoff and landing where things are pretty well under control. But let's say you're a bit disoriented, maybe because, because you can't see too well because of the weather. Perhaps you're looking for a landing field and therefore flying quite slowly you can see how easily you can slip behind the curve and start to sink. And if you're distracted enough, maybe the nose comes up and you sink some more. And somewhere in the middle of that high drag area is the stall speed waiting to dump you into a spin. That's how so many accidents happen. Also, in a dead engine situation where you're trying to make a field, if you get behind the minimum drag speed, you will land shorter. However, note that because the drag curve is quite flat just above the minimum drag speed, increasing speed by pushing the nose down a bit really doesn't have much of a penalty at all. Do you see that? And if you're gliding into wind, that extra speed makes a big difference in the distance covered. So grab an extra five knots and you'll probably do as well, if not better, than sticking to the best glide speed. And you're much more likely to arrive alive than trying to stretch your glide by raising the nose. It's completely counterintuitive, isn't it? That's one of the nice, nice peculiarities of aircraft, is their counterintuitivity. So on that happy note, we will conclude this lecture. And the next lecture will be on performance.